what alcohol does to you. And I've actually seen Arnie in different states, you know, sometimes past. I don't even know who you are or whatever. So I realized that this this is serious. By 1987, Lennox Lewis was a full-time boxer, although still an amateur. He had turned down heavyweight dollars to turn pro for one more shot at Olympic gold. I came so close the first time in 84 in the Olympics, I realized, boy, this is four years later. I should be able to win. There's nobody that should be able to step in my way. This time, he'd be going into the ring without the man who had transformed him from a bully to a first-class boxer. He needed somebody that could be with him every day. Arnie Beam had spent most every day with Lennox since the boy arrived in Canada from London at age 13. Nearly a decade later, Beam lost his day job for devoting too much time to training and traveling with the prodigy. I was paying the rent for the gym out of my own pocket. Because I lost my job, I had to give up that gym. Lennox says his mentor started drinking to excess. At certain times, we get phone calls in the middle of the night, you know, Arnie's down there, you know, we need to sort him out. I have a talk with Arnie. I told him, you can't be looking after the boys and drinking, that you're not setting a good example. Beam had helped hire a coach for the Canadian national team, Adrian Tedesco. He sent Lennox to train with his friend Egerton Marcus in Toronto. In the Olympic Training Center, training with Adrian and training with sparring with, with better opposition, it picked his game up. I missed him, but, but he never lost track of me. He never forgot about me. Lennox arrived in Seoul, South Korea the following summer, determined to make his patience pay off in gold. He cruised into the medal bout against the favorite, American Riddick Foe. Foe got the best of him in round one. In the second round, realizing that he could not win the fight the way it was going, he just physically overpowered our American heavyweight. Lewis screaming at him in the corner, and Lewis has come out inspired. The referee stopped the fight in round two. And the winner is Lewis. Call me that night. And he said, Arnie, that right hand was for you. I said, yeah, good. I said, but I have a question. He said, what's that? I said, what took you so long? <laughs> Four years of blood, sweat, and tears had finally brought Lennox Olympic gold. He came back home. He had the medal. And all I could think of is four years before that when he'd come back home from the L.A. Olympics. And he said, I'm going to win the gold medal. Then move on from there. Lennox a hero's welcome. But Lennox's adopted homeland had no big-time boxing promoters. Either he's going to go to the U.S. or to Britain. The Americans control the belts. You know, nobody else really can control the belts. But I'm saying boxing started in England. I remember him saying to me, if he goes to Britain, he gets to be the big fish. Lennox Lewis was going home on his own terms. He signed a revolutionary contract with London promoter Frank Maloney. Lennox's take of each fight would be a whopping 70%. They had to house him, and all the training expenses and everything else come out of the management's 30%. Lennox demanded veto power over trainers and opponents. He even negotiated a salary for his mother, who quit her assembly line job after 17 years. He wanted to make sure when it came to his life that he was in control. Lewis's return to London was hardly a homecoming. There was, I would call it indifference, especially from the mainstream press. In some places, outright antagonism towards Lennox because they didn't... They had this thing that he wasn't British. Being in Canada, they say, I sound British. Being over here, they say, I sound American. So I can't really win. I said to myself, you know, when I'm a heavyweight champion of the world, 
Who's going to claim me? Lennox let his hands do the talking. He went 14-0 and with 12 knockouts. Even so, British fans ignored him in favor of Frank Bruno, a former European champion on the downside of his career. They built Frank Bruno with the media. To get to Bruno, Lennox first had to square off against British champion Gary Mason, rated number four in the world. Nobody's quite sure who's going to make the fight. This was a must-win fight for Lennox. Lennox entered the ring a heavy underdog. something to think about. The way he fought that fight was uh, with his jab, and it was just it's amazing to see. Lewis, left hand, finds its way very easily into the face of Gary Mason. He jabbed Mason's head off. Lennox Lewis, he proved himself the better man on this night. The Mason fight made Lennox a legitimate contender for the heavyweight crown. The British press was less than impressed. It was hard to get newspapers and television stations to come to Lennox Lewis press conferences. A master tactician in and out of the ring, Lewis plotted a campaign to gain respect and get a shot at the title. Once you beat him, you know, he will always try and revenge any defeat that he has. That's part of his character. In November of 91, Lennox stepped back into the ring with Terrell Biggs, the man who had spoiled his first Olympic bid. The following fall, he faced off against Razor Ruddock, who had handed Lennox his first amateur defeat. The winner would get a shot at the undisputed heavyweight crown. When we stepped in the ring, I just rushed him and mulled them. <laughs> Razor. That was it. Lennox Lewis of London is headed uptown. His high school girlfriend, Marcia Miller, had been by his side for every victory. Closing in on his first title bout, he gave her a diamond ring. Lennox had managed his career and life to near perfection, but he could not have predicted heavyweight champ Riddick Bowe's next move. Bo didn't want to fight him. Bo didn't want to lose. Initially, the two sides could not come to terms for a title fight. By the time Lennox relented and offered to take the deal, Bo refused. Lennox wants his belt, then we'll be calling him the goddess pick. That was his way of getting out of the fight with Lennox Lewis because he knew he was cruising for a loser. The World Boxing Council took Lennox's side, stripping Bo of his belt and awarding it to Lennox. He learned of the WBC's decision while vacationing in Jamaica. First, he locked up in his room, you know, and moping about it. That's the most I've ever seen him agitated by anything. It's just the inability to get that fight. He's willing to, you know, duck and dive. I'll wait for him. He's got the belt, but he hasn't got the acclaim that goes with winning the belt. Lennox Lewis was the champion. By default, Riddick Bowe was the first fighter from his past to run and hide, but he would not be the last. When Mike Tyson refused to fight him and gave up his championship, it was just a, a really crushing blow for Lennox. I know it does eat away at him, but what can he do? In 1993, Lennox Lewis became the first British-born boxer to wear the heavyweight crown in more than a century. But it had been handed to him on a silver platter. He had fought his way to the title, but not actually won it in the ring. It was no fault of Lennox that Riddick Bowe decided to throw this belt into the bin. The former champ had refused to fight, and for that, Riddick Bowe was publicly ridiculed. Lennox was undefeated, but he wasn't even the most admired boxer in Great Britain, much less the world. The great British hope at that point had been Frank Bruner, and he'd been built up into a national icon. British people loved the loser. You know, if you lose, they, they just loved you even more. 
October of 93, Lennox gave the great British hope a shot at the WBC belt. Now uh, I think they've uh, accepted me. Lewis in trouble in the corner. And Lanza can take the left hook. Which they should have in the beginning because I was always British. Amazing, the Bruno stands up. And now Mickey Band stops the fight. He had proven himself to Great Britain, but his life plan was on the ropes. His romance with Marcia was falling apart. The constant pressure of the public eye had been too much for the relationship to bear. That winter, the wedding plans were called off. You know, we were pretty uh, thick-headed, both of us. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of different people around us, you know, telling us different things. So we kind of, like, grew apart. Marcia was not in the crowd when Lennox fought a relative nobody. Oliver McCall. I was throwing a punch. He was throwing a punch at the same time. I got caught with it. What is this? I can't believe what I just saw. For the first time as a pro, Lennox tasted defeat. His reign as champ was over. There were, of course, those that called into his to question his right to have ever been champion. Lennox actually turned to us and said, listen, why are you all sad? It was like a weight was lifted off my shoulder, you know, a burden, you know, all of a sudden, okay, I slipped, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not perfect. He lifted everybody up in that room and we all got up and said, right, let's go, let's get out there. Ever patient. Lennox shied away from the spotlight and waited for a chance to win a title in the ring. 